Hey, what's up out there, everybody? Welcome back to Movies Never Say Die. This is episode six of my top 100 action movies from the 1990s series. We're moving right along. If you've uh, missed the first five episodes, I will leave them linked in this video for you guys to check out later. But in this one, I'm covering movies number 50 through 41, 10 films that deliver a little bit of everything from some action in the wilderness to a guy's night gone wrong with some martial arts and tons of gunplay. So let's get into it. In at number 50 is an entry in one of the great action franchises ever. The tagline was simple, the magic is back again, and it certainly was in 1992's Lethal Weapon 3, directed by Richard Donner, starring all the usual suspects, Mel Gibson and Danny Glover and Joe Pesci, and this time a Rene Russo making her franchise debut. Now, while not as good as the first two, I do think Lethal Weapon 3 is still a damn good action flick with loads of just visually stunning practical effects. You get Gibson and Glover again, who are top notch as always in this franchise. Then uh, you get the addition of Rene Russo and the amplification of Pesci's Leo Getz, which are all able to open the door to more humor outside of the Riggs and Murtaugh banter. I think the story overall is nicely structured. It keeps a smooth pace and it brings a charming variety to the action from the explosive intro to the chase sequences the fight scenes and the shootout there really is a buffet of action all with the lovable characters that we know from this series so it's a good time now admittedly the villain here the ex-cop stealing weaponry is a bit limited i would have preferred a larger screen presence for the heavy of this movie but as it stands lethal weapon 3 is still a very engaging watch Moving along to number 49 is a great espionage thriller about a man on a mission, not for his country and not for his honor, but for his wife and child. When Harrison Ford would star as Jack Ryan in 1992's Patriot Games, directed by Philip Noyce, also starring Ann Archer, Sean Bean and Patrick Bergen. Admittedly, this is much more of an espionage government agency crime drama movie than it is a traditional action flick, but I do think when the action kicks in that Patriot Games is a suspenseful ride with a charming international atmosphere. You get Harrison Ford, who I think is exceptional in the lead. He's a, a viable action hero when the story needs him to be, but he also has that softer humanity to him as well, and I think that duality in his role is really what makes this movie so much more intriguing because uh, you truly can immerse yourself in the mission thrown at Jack Ryan's feet. I think Sean Bean and Patrick Bergen are both uh, very strong in their roles as well, as is Ann Archer. And I think the game of cat and mouse that Patriot Games explores is well structured. It's uh, evenly paced and capped off with a truly unnerving finale that I think will leave you plenty satisfied. Director Ernest R. Dickerson delivered a winner with my number 48 pick set out in the wilderness where humans are hunting humans in the often forgotten Surviving the Game from 1994 starring Ice-T, Rucker Hauer, Charles S. Dutton, Gary Busey, F. Murray Abraham, and John C. McGinley. Now, I think this is a tragically overlooked action film from the middle of the decade that takes the human hunting human formula and does it extremely well. Ice-T is uh, great in this movie, but I think surviving the game shows how delightfully intense of a film you can get when the villains carry a larger screen presence than the hero does because Howard, Dutton, and Busey are all menacing in their own way. Ice-T certainly does carry his own, with the film never taking him out of his lane. I mean, he's not really suddenly taking guys out easily. I think it makes the carried suspense of this film much more effective, as he has to kind of use his ingenuity to survive. This is also, I think, a slickly directed film. The on-location shoots out in the wilderness, much like Cliffhanger did, is really able to pull you out into the mountains with these characters, and I think it's a great ride with a world-class ensemble cast and just enough twists and turns to keep you guessing. Now, my pick for number 47 is a forgotten gem with a strong 80s vibe from director Dwight H. Little about a man who is unarmed and extremely dangerous in 1992's Rapid Fire, starring Brandon Lee and Powers Booth. 
Brandon Lee's life was tragically cut short, but I think Rapid Fire will always be a sample of what he could have provided to the action genre. To me, Rapid Fire is like Brandon Lee's Lionheart, a chance for him to lead his own film for Western audiences. And he is great as a student who sees something he shouldn't have. There's no denying this is a by the numbers assembly line action movie. But I think with the charisma in Lee's performance, it's just undeniable. I mean, he's charming, he's sexy and effortless in delivering smooth, fluid fight choreography. I do wish this movie had a little bit more action to it as it goes through the motions, but uh, what is here really does work more than well enough, I think. It's uh, really subtle, but I think the choreography in this movie is absolutely fantastic. The uh, fight scenes and the action scenes are great, and Powers Booth is as always, fantastic, and I think he gives the film a viable villain. You may not have seen this movie, or you may have forgotten that it even existed, but when the action is in full gear in this movie, Rapid Fire is a great time. We're going to jump hundreds of years into the future for my number 46 pick from director Luke Besson. It stars Bruce Willis, Mila Jovovich, and Gary Oldman. Time is not important, only life is important, and all life will be lost unless they find the fifth element from 1997. I do enjoy sitting back and watching this sci-fi extravaganza from time to time. The story is admittedly a bit messy, but it's enough to connect all the elaborate action sequences and with the performances from Willis and uh, Jovovich and old men i think there's uh, no shortage of screen presence to carry these focal characters the fifth element i do think is longer than it needed to be but i can appreciate the conceptual design the production design and the wardrobes and really the world building i think it's all more than enough to have a great time with the mental escape that this movie provides the uh, fifth element i think is highly engaging and it's enough to overlook its flaws because overall i think it is well acted the uh, creativity in the action is edge of your seat fun and i think the blend of practical and digital effects results in a film that visually still looks just as polished today as it did back when it was released. Next up at 45 is another of those movies that just simply has its own wild and unique tone. A terrifying evil has been unleashed and only five strangers are the hope of stopping it in 1996's From Dust Till Dawn, starring George Clooney, Quentin Tarantino, Harvey Keitel, Juliette Lewis, and others from director Robert Rodriguez. Now, I certainly think From Dust Till Dawn is another one of those movies that could take a run at being the most wild and over the top to make this list. And decades later, this movie still holds up as a delightfully fun, ultra violent ride of just grindhouse mayhem and action. I think where this movie really shines is in its unique but uh, very simple story. Don't ask too many questions. Just sit back and enjoy the sadistic ride led by this fantastic ensemble cast. Clooney is as cool as a killer can be. I think Tarantino is just as eerie and demented as he needed to be. Kaitel shines as the righteous one. And really, they are just the tip of the iceberg in terms of bold and vibrant personalities found inside the titty twister on this night of carnage from uh, dust till dawn. Never takes its foot off the gas. It's filled with gory spectacle and twisted humor and just endless violence. I will admit that uh, most of the digital effects don't really hold up so well, but this movie is still a fun, nostalgic timestamp to those movies from the mid-90s. Moving along to my number 44 pick, I have a Western-themed action thriller set in a town with no justice, which means there is only one law, Every Man for Himself in 1996's Last Man Standing, starring Bruce Willis, Bruce Dern, Christopher Walken, and directed by Walter Hill. Now, The Last Man Standing to me is another of those films that I think was a bit overlooked when it was released. I think this movie was a direct-to-video release, if I remember correctly, but I think it delivers plenty of big screen worthy Western themed action. You get Bruce Willis, who's just simmering in this role as the loner, who's a complete badass. And then you get the vibrant personalities of Bruce Dern and Christopher Walken. And the result is a delightfully methodical uh, modern Western that explodes with action when the story calls for it. The gunplay and tension are effective. And The Last Man Standing is a movie that kind of just feels lived in. It's an escape into the old West and filled with all the masculine bravado you'd expect. I think this one delivers a 
fun, rewarding, slow buildup. It closes in solid, satisfying fashion. And with the direction from Walter Hill, there's a visual polish to this movie that still enables it to look great today. Now, coming in at number 43 is a forgotten gem that I just love. It's a military-themed action thriller about America's designated hitters on terrorism. They are Navy SEALs from 1990, starring Charlie Sheen, Michael Bean, Bill Paxton, and Dennis Haysbert from a director, Louis Teague. I won't argue this is a more military-themed action romp than it is a movie relying on realism, but that does not keep this film from taking the viewer on a thrilling ride of bravado and gritty action and superficial emotions. Navy Seals is a film you watch with a certain suspension of disbelief. This isn't a biopic, it's a a full-throttle action movie oozing with masculinity and melodrama, and it's fantastic. I think the cast overall is perfect for the needs of these roles. Uh, Charlie Sheen and Michael Bean carry the pace more than effectively, and of uh, the supporting members with guys like Bill Paxton and Dennis Haysbert get their moments to shine individually as well, but really what makes this film stand out is that it's decently acted, the performances do elevate the writing, and it's able to easily engage interest between the barrages of missions and shootouts and just visually appealing stunt work because Navy Seals is a bit forgotten, but it holds up as one of the decade's best action movies. Coming up next at number 42 is an often forgotten real-time action thriller about a group of guys who go out for a night of boxing, but when they make the wrong turn, they find themselves in a fight for survival in 1993's Judgment Night, starring Emilio Estevez, Cuba Gooding Jr., Stephen Dorff, Jeremy Piven, and Dennis Leary. I think this is one of those real-time situational action thrillers that can naturally lure you into the many situations that are suspensefully delivered throughout the runtime. Estevez and Gooding Jr. are definitely driving the good guys, but really the ensemble cast overall is strong. That ensemble is what makes this movie what it is. And then on the villain side, this one delivers a truly menacing performance from Dennis Leary, who despite his scene chewing in this film is a great bad guy, but he also has great villain actor Peter Green in his corner to help stack the deck against our innocent friends who just wanted to go to a boxing match, but really where Judgment Night shines is and its pacing, its gritty direction, and just how the story overall navigates this rundown section of town. It's just a thrilling playground for our heroes to get tossed into, and it's a string of harrowing moments and bursts of action that rarely overplay their hand. This movie keeps it grounded and injects a phenomenal musical soundtrack, and the result is still awesome decades later. And my number 41 movie is a bona fide cult classic. Dolph Lundgren's a warrior. Brandon Lee's a wise guy. They're two L.A. cops going after Japan's most ruthless gangster in 1991. Showdown in Little Tokyo, directed by Mark L. Lester. Now, the flaws in Showdown in Little Tokyo are front and center. It's a bit shallow, it's predictable, and the overall buddy formula is routine. Yet, none of that gets in the way of this being a wildly fun and fast-paced action romp with both Lundgren and Lee knowing exactly what this movie wanted to be and then playing up to their roles perfectly to deliver that. I think the late Brandon Lee certainly steals the show from Lundgren. He's hilarious in this film with a strong comedic timing and together Lee and Lundgren are more than effective as a duo for the needs of this B action flick. It's filled with action from the shootouts to fight scenes to Lundgren jumping over cars and flipping them over with his bare hands. It's a riot of the action genre cliches, but it's amazing at the same time. Plus, Kerry Hiroyuki Tagawa comes in to deliver a fantastic over-the-top villain, and then Tia Carrera comes in to serve as effective window dressing. So this movie provides more than enough to make it one of the decade's best in the genre without question. And that wraps up this list for today, guys. Another 10 movies, 50 through 41. Great films, all worth checking out if you haven't seen them. Also, once again, if you did miss any of the other episodes of this series, I'll have them linked all over here for you guys to check out later. Be on the lookout for episode 7 coming very soon, right around the 1st of April. I'm going to be going out of town next week, but after that, I'm going to be back on the grind. I hope to see you guys all back for the next episode of the series. I hope you guys are enjoying this series. It's been a blast 
blast to make. I appreciate you guys watching. It's greatly appreciated. And until my next video, movies never say die. This is Jack Burton and the Pork Chop Express, and I'm talking to whoever's listening out there. Live a war. You gotta become war. I suppose we have to register you as a lethal weapon. You trying to say Jesus Christ can't hit a curveball?